In the previous video, we talked about development aid. You can check it if you missed it. Today's question is, what are the effects of migration from the perspective of the country of origin and of destination? Migration occurs for various reasons. The immigrant groups can be composed of temporary workers, professionals, asylum seekers, refugees and others. Let's begin our analysis from the neoclassical model of the labor market. According to this model, the impact of migration streams in the source and receiver country are very different. When migration occurs, the native workers in the receiver country suffer welfare losses and the newcomers, compared to their wages in their native country, enjoy higher earnings. From an employer perspective in the receiver country, the labor pool expands, which translates into a broader choice of employees for the business owners. On the other hand, when people emigrate, the workers in the source country also experience welfare gains. This effect occurs due to the shrinking labor force, so labor becomes more valuable. The neoclassical model is very simplified and ill-suited for capturing all effects that are linked to migration. The immigrants should not be perceived simply as a water drop in the labor force as they are involved in entrepreneurial activities, consume products and change the societies. Due to the new knowledge they bring to their destination country, the newcomers can drive innovations, thus be a valuable source of economic growth. The demand effect should be considered as well. A growing population increases the demand for products in the country, which leads to job creation and wage increases, meaning that natives also gain from this effect. Furthermore, when the size of the market increases, be it due to immigration or natural population growth, the economy can exploit the economies of scale, thus operate more efficiently. Contrarily, Due to the reduction of number of consumers, the demand effect is affected negatively in the source country. The immigrant remittances or the money transfer of the immigrants to their homelands is another factor to be taken into consideration. Some critics of immigration insist that their country loses from immigration, pointing out the money sent back to the source countries. The claim that the outflow of money is so great to reduce to aggregate demand in the country of destination can hardly be supported by empirical evidence. Due to the positive impact of remittances on the source country's overall welfare, some populous countries adopt policies to encourage emigration. As a further argument against immigration, is mentioned the extensive usage of public services and welfare programs by immigrants. Even if it was the case, numerous studies suggest that immigrants in the United States pay more in taxes than receive government-provided benefits. Moreover, the contribution to the social system of the second-generation migrants is even greater than by their parents. Another significant factor is the brain drain effect, which affects the poorer countries as the emigration of educated and highly qualified people hampers their development potential. As already mentioned, the neoclassical model of the labor market is incapable to explain the whole picture. The model is too simplified to capture all of the effects that occur. In reality, the impacts are interconnected, complex and dynamic, therefore they should be analyzed from different perspectives and through various methods. If you've been listening carefully to the terminology the mainstream media uses, you may have noticed that the people moving from the poor to wealthier countries are referred to as emigrants and the people moving abroad from the countries of the global north are called expatriates or expats. 
So, if an individual is highly educated but happens to originate from a poor country, he is an immigrant and not an expat. One may argue that even the existence of such a standard is discriminatory because if you are a white European or from the United States, even if you are not educated or skilled, you are an expat. But a chemical engineer from the Philippines is an immigrant. What's your opinion on this distinction? Please let me know down in the comments because now we have to move on. Let's look at the cultural effects of migration. This topic keeps its relevance especially in Europe primarily due to the influx of people from war-torn countries from the Middle East and Africa or economic migration from Eastern Europe. The critics of immigration often make the statement that they don't have anything against immigrants as people but against immigration in general. It is understandable that the people in Europe and the United States are intimidated due to the changing demographics of their countries. In metropolitan areas, people seem to adapt to the new reality quickly, but in sparsely populated parts of the European countries or the United States, the fears remain. One may argue that the people against immigration defend this viewpoint not due to the lack of altruistic feelings but due to their various fears, which can be covered by two words money and security. Furthermore, problematic is the belief that immigrants are naturally involved in illegal activities. If even a tiny minority of immigrants get involved in illegal activities or disrespect the local laws, the media portrays it in an exaggerated manner which leads to the building of barriers between the locals and the immigrants. The lack of bridges and mutual understanding between the newcomers and the native people leads to the emergence of different sub-communities. The next step is the creation of parallel communities where only people of the same ethnic background or religion interact with each other. The observations that some migrant groups have difficulties with integration in their new societies is not a wrong assumption. Some chapters of Francis Fukuyama's book The Origins of Political Order hints that integration may be difficult due to the different institutions prevailing in the source and receiver country. If we stick to Hodgson's definition of institutions as systems of established and prevalent social rules that structure social interactions, the origins of the issue becomes easy to recognize. The institutions rooted in the global north and for example in sub-Saharan Africa are not identical. For example, in the global north, a medicine man is a person with a medical degree. On the other hand, in some rural regions in Africa, a medicine man may be the local shaman who prepares potion from herbs. The same institutional differences can be observed in the solving of family disputes. People in the global north prefer going to courts, but in some cultures the solution is found in the involvement of an elder from the family as a mediator. In the need of a financial support, a typical individual from the global north will go to a bank, but a person from a culture with strong family ties will first go to his relatives. The existence of institutions in Western Europe such as welfare state and health insurance made the need for a large family and strong family ties obsolete. On the other hand, being part of a group of people, such as a clan in rural northern Nigeria, can be decisive if one will survive in this environment or not. The fact that some solutions work in rural Nigeria doesn't mean that they will work in Sweden and the Swedish solutions may not work in rural Nigeria. 
Evaluating all those factors, one can conclude that the movement of large masses of people will keep changing the societies. And policymakers will be challenged to make the best decisions to maximize the positive effects and minimize the negative effects of migration for the receiver and the source countries. I will list my book recommendations in the description. If you want to earn cryptocurrencies while browsing the internet, you can use my referral link down in the description to download the Brave browser. It's free. Don't forget to smash the subscribe button and see you next time.